Welcome, welcome back to Are You Sure the Podcast. We uh had a great live session um on Sunday, uh last Sunday, and we are here back um with the um with the pre-recorded uh podcast in a sense. Um we just had to work out some logistics, but we still wanted to be sure that we was we're in a live setting so that we can um continue to do what we set out to do. Um Nothing's really changed. We've got some great content for you here with Elder Sykes. And yes. uh, we are here to bring you another great podcast. Um, thank you for everybody who tuned in last week. Um, we've got some uh, some good follow up. And hopefully you did your homework because we ended up on the cliffhanger, which we will address. Yes. Um, so without further ado, let's get started. Uh, Elder Sykes, let's uh, let's jump right in. Um, today's, uh, yeah, let's do a little summary of our, um, last week's episode, which was humble beginnings part one, which is of course the opening scenes of the Bible, which is Genesis chapter one. And as we said, we were trying to answer some basic questions. What does this tell us about God and what does it reveal about God's character? And, you know, also what does it mean for us in relation to God? And so some of the things that we saw were that, you know, Genesis shows us the sovereignty of God as a creator. He created all things. And also because he created all things, that God also has the right to make the rules. But, you know, I think more um, pointedly, the fact that God had provided everything for man's benefit and man's comfort, it's revealed God as a loving parent. And that this is really what I believe he wants us to see about his character in Genesis is that he provides everything for man without man having to appease him. You know, um, he created everything for man before man was created. And so man did not have to work for what God gave him. But God did require obedience to maintain um, things in their you know peaceful state that he had you know made them. And then we also looked at the three layers of scripture, um, the surface, the spiritual warfare, and the prophetic. And that's when we ended on that cliffhanger as well about the Garden of Eden. Now, we know that God had spoke everything into existence, except for man, of course, in which he made um, the dust of the ground. But it also says of Eden that he planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man. And so we kind of asked the question, where did Eden come from? But before we go and dive into answering that question, we want to look at uh, Genesis chapter two from a wide scope. And as we um, go through the chapter, then we want to zoom in on Eden, because that's going to set us up for our next episode in um, the series. And so when we look at Genesis chapter two, as we said, uh, episode one was called Humble Beginnings, part one, the opening scenes. But Genesis chapter 2 opens with the closing scenes of the opening uh, scenes of creation. And so as we look at Genesis chapter 2 and we see these open opening scenes of Genesis chapter 2, which again are the closing scenes of the creation story, we see that the seventh day is set apart from the other six active days by the creator's rest. And so here's the first place where we have the idea of the seventh day Sabbath coming in to view. And, you know, um, I think that really sets the tone for chapter two, because rest is a theme that runs through chapter two from beginning to end, which is where we got the title for this episode. All is at rest. And so. Um, if you look at Genesis chapter two, verses one through three, we're not going to read those right now. We'll kind of read some things as we go through. But Genesis chapter two, verses one through three, it introduces the Sabbath. The word Sabbath actually means rest. All right. When you look at Genesis chapter two and verse seven, this is where he created man of the dust of the ground. But man was brought forth in a lifeless state. He wasn't brought forth alive as everyone else. And when you look at verse 17, this is where we have the first um, mention of death. If you eat a tree, ye shall surely die. 
Now, we also know that death is also referred to as a rest, like in the phrase that we sometimes use, may he rest in peace. And so this is another type of rest that's being introduced in Genesis chapter 2. And then, of course, in verse 8, we have that he planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man. Well, Eden was a paradise. It was a place of rest. And then you also have in um, verse 21, where it says he caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, where he took the rib to make Eve. Now, sleep is also a type of rest. And then, of course, he makes Eve and he brings Adam, or excuse me, Eve to Adam. And then we have the first marriage um, on earth. And you know, we, we had this discussion before, but in, uh, before sin, marriage was intended to be a relationship in which people found rest. And it's still, it's still intended to be that today, but of course, because of sin, you know, there's a lot of problems in marriage because we have two fallen individuals trying to blend their lives together. And then that's where you start to see that, you know, selfishness and selfishness doesn't really, you know, make a good, uh, strong bind. Well, from my perspective, marriage is work. <laughs> it is. <laughs> marriage is work, you know what I'm saying? And uh, But in, in its original context, what God intended was that marriage would be a place where those two people found rest and they would, you know, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, and we know that's still, again, that's still his intention today. But it was it's, before sin. It was before, before sin. Before sin. Now, after sin, again, you're dealing with two fallen individuals coming together. When we talk about fallen individuals, we're talking about selfish individuals. Right. And that selfishness is going to cause marriage to be work. Right. All right. So, and this is why we need Christ in the midst of our marriages in order for it to work that we can, you know, ask for forgiveness when we need to ask for forgiveness, that we can be patient when we need to be patient, that we can give forgiveness when our spouses need, you know, forgiveness. Right. And so really it's kind of a miniature of the relationship that we have in our marriage to Christ. Right. You know what I'm saying? Where he is, he's, he's selfless married to somebody that's selfish, meaning us. And so he's always on the end having to, you know, apolog uh, accept apologies and, you know, give forgiveness and so on and so forth. But again, uh, but the, the key is that rest is a theme growing through Genesis chapter two from beginning to end, starting with the Sabbath, talking about um, Eden, death itself, Adam being put to sleep, and finally the relationship with marriage. So here's a question I have. Of course, I'm always yeah uh, causing a little mayhem here, but and this is a this is a valid question in, from Genesis two too. You know, on the seventh day, you know, God into this work if he made and he rested on the seventh. Why would somebody with such infinite power need to rest? Brother, that is a very deep and <laughs> profound question. And, you know, I don't know how deep we can get into that one. But of course, as you said, you know, somebody who is this powerful, who does not need to rest, you know what I'm saying? That there is no searching of his power, you know what I'm saying? The, the, the creator of the heavens and the earth does not get weary. That's a scripture where he says that, and yet he rests. But I will say this in regards to that, mm -hmm. you know, because you brought out, like I said, a very interesting point. God is called the creator, correct? Mm -hmm. So if he is the creator, God creating is not out of the ordinary, right? Right. It's not out of the ordinary. So the other six days, God is doing what comes pretty much ordinary right. to him. But the fact that somebody who doesn't get weary or tired decides to rest an entire 24 hours, doesn't that make that day stand out more than the other six? Yeah. Because now he's doing something that is out of character. He's doing something that is unusual. The creator creating is his normal, you know, activity. Mm. But when the creator who does not get weary decides to stop and rest, and then not only that, he blesses the day, <laughs> sets it apart, and sanctifies it. Doesn't it make that day stand out, you know, above the other six? Right. So we can't go into, you know, all of what that may have meant, you know, in this discussion. But, you know, that thought that that day stands out because God is doing something out of the ordinary. And so, again, this is why we call it, you know, the creator's memorial. Right. You know I'm saying I don't call it just the Sabbath. It's the Creator's memorial. This is something that he did and that was out of the ordinary and, and set it in place as a memorial of what he did for mankind. 
Yeah, I kind of look at it too, as you said, an example. It's saying, if, you know, I don't need to rest. If I rest it, when I tell you that this is what you need to do, then you shouldn't have any excuse. Exactly. Yeah. And, and the thing is, God doesn't always, you know, tell us the benefits or, you know, the reasons why he does things. He gives us ample reason to mm -hmm. obey him based on, you know, what he's done for us. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you don't get the understanding of things until you disobey. Mm -hmm. You know, the thing is, what I want to know is, God, what did you say? Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to do what you say. And in the midst of doing what you say, I'm going to seek you for why you told me to do what you said. Right. But it's not going to be asking you why before I do what I know you've said. Right. If I know that you said it, I'm going to do it, even if I don't understand it. Right. But what, once I go to do it, I know that you don't do anything arbitrarily. Everything you do has a purpose. Everything you do has a blessing and a benefit, even if I can't see it from the beginning. Right. So when I set myself to obey while I'm, I'm in the midst of that obedience, I'm going to be seeking God for what are you trying to accomplish by what you are, you know, commanding to be done. Right. So, yeah. But, you know, these things that we're talking about as far as in Genesis chapter 2 and the different arrests that are there, you know, Genesis is an interesting word because if you take the IS off of Genesis, we know it means beginning, you know, the word Genesis. But if you take the IS off the um, word Genesis, you're left with the word genes. genes. And genes pretty much in a simplistic, you know, explanation, genes influence what comes after. Genes. And so in the book of Genesis, it's a foundation that is very important to understand what comes after, and specifically in the end. Because mm -hmm. remember, we I, we I don't know if we touched upon this in the first episode, but um, I'm pretty sure we did. But in Isaiah 46, God says that he declares the end from the beginning. I think we did. Yeah, I think we did. Briefly. Briefly. Yeah, we did. yeah. And so if God is declaring the end from the beginning, these things that he decided to um, record in the Bible in Genesis is because they have a bearing on the end. We know that we don't have all the details of everything that happened, even in the six days of creation. We don't have all 24 hours of, you know, every little thing that God did. Right. As we talk about, um, we're going to talk about in Genesis chapter 2, you know, there are some things that he tells us in Genesis, Genesis chapter 2 that he did that he didn't tell us that he did in Genesis chapter 1. Right. Specifically on the sixth day. But again, um, genes influence what come at, comes after. Okay. And these things that are being introduced in Genesis really have an impact on what comes after, and specifically the last days. Mm -hmm. So if we just take, like, uh, the Seventh-day Sabbath, you know, right now, we're at the, I believe we're at the end of the world. Nobody else believes that I believe we're at the end of the world. <laughs> you know? And there's, you know, several ways you can study the Bible to know that. Not mm -hmm. the exact day of hour. Nobody's trying to predict Christ is coming or what's the last day of the world. But he I, says people will know from the signs. Yeah, you know? of course. You'll and, know that it's near. Yeah, and I look at it like this. When when somebody say, you know, if I say, you know, I'm coming to see you this weekend, right? Yeah. Okay, you know this weekend that, that I know this weekend you're coming. It might be Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. Yeah. So in a sense he's told us I'm coming this weekend. So yeah, we, we know <laughs> we know that it's near. We, yeah. we we know that it's getting close. Yeah. And that's what he told us. Yeah. But you know, here um, in the last days, especially, a lot of these things that are introduced in Genesis chapter 2 are major issues. Mm -hmm. And the Sabbath, you know, whether it's still sacred, mm -hmm. it's an issue now here in the last days. Mm -hmm. and, you know, so some people call it, you know, um, the, the Jewish Sabbath and so on and so forth. But again, I call it the creative memorial. But also death. Death is introduced here in Genesis chapter 2. Now, what happens after you die is a major issue here in the last days. Mm -hmm. You know, whether you die and you're surely dead or you die or you go straight to heaven or you die and you go straight to hell or you, as some people believe, you die and you walk around, you come visit people and you, you, you tell psychics things and so on and so forth. So what happens after you die is now a major issue here in the last days. But this is introduced in Genesis chapter 2. Also marriage, introduced in Genesis chapter 2. And now today, what constitutes a true marriage is a major issue. 
Is it between a man and a woman only, or can there be various types of different marriages? Mm -hmm. These things are issues in the last days. However, all of these things are introduced in Genesis chapter 2. Mm. Coincidence, or is it not a coincidence? Mm. So, you know, so again, um, people call the Sabbath the Jewish Sabbath. You know, we're going to talk about a few of these things today, but again, I call the Seventh day Sabbath Creative Memorial. Yeah, now, if, if you noticed, uh, you know, there's a lot of controversy around around that, and it's a lot of stuff we won't get into right now, whether we should, you know, how, how it, you know, ironically ends up being one of the commandments and things like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but even to tie in before we get to that point, um, the fact that he set the example um, for us, he, he pretty much... You know, the thing that we have to realize is he created the Sabbath for us, basically. Yeah. Um, he designed us. He knew, you know, what our body needs. Um, he knew um, that we would just need that time to commune with him and to just get into a space that would, you know, allow us to stay focused on, on earth. Yeah. Um, you know, not, that's not, the one thing. Not to forget who had provided everything. Right, right. You know what I'm saying? Who provided. Yeah. You know, the one thing that, you know, we, we forget is, you know, and I'm going to jump a little bit to the commandment, and, and I, I know we're going to get to that at some point, is that's one of the one things that we have to kind of make a sacrifice for him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, I, and, and it's directly our relationship with him is, you know, that's kind of like spending time, you know, like you and your dad go to the park on Saturdays. That's That's our thing. Yeah, you know, that's that's kind of what that is. So, see, I, I like the way you said that. So that commandment is kind of directly related to him and our relationship with him. Right. And, you know, spending time with him and so on and so forth. Right. You, you know, the way he had ordained. Right. You know, that doesn't mean if, you know, if your father says, son, on this day right here, I want to spend some special time with you. That does not negate you spending time with him anytime you feel like it. You know right. what I'm saying? But right. If he's asking for something specific, you know what I'm saying, as a loving son, you say, okay, Pops, I'll, I'll make that happen. You know right. what I'm saying? But it doesn't mean that I don't want to see you any other day. Right. It, anytime you want to spend time with God, you can spend time with God. But this is a special request from God. You know what I'm saying? Right. And so the reason I, I don't necessarily like to refer to it as the Jewish Sabbath, I think it diminishes, you know, what God has done. Mm -hmm. And you're trying to isolate it to a specific group of people when it was actually brought forth before that group of people ever existed. Right. It was brought forth in Genesis chapter two. Right. And, um, you know, from the beginning, it was always based on what God did and what, not what man did. And so I don't believe that the Sabbath has ever been based on what man does. When we, let's just go to, let's just read Genesis chapter two. We're talking about it. Let's just read, you know, those few verses. And it says, thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made. And he, God, rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day. And God also sanctified it because that in it, he, God, had rested from all his work, which God created and made. So you see how man doesn't really appear, <laughs> you know, in this first uh introduction of the sabbath right it's all about what god did so the sabbath has never been dependent on a man to keep it to um to acknowledge it and so on and so forth i mean me you and the whole world cannot acknowledge the sabbath it's still going to be what it was because it's based on what god did he created in six days he rested he blessed it he sanctified it so it's based on what god did you know he set a pattern actually for when he requests something of us, he always gives an example, you know. So he's given an example, like, okay, I rested. You know, when Christ came, this is the example, you know. So he doesn't just say, hey, or do this, but he's saying this can be done. If I can yeah. do it, it can be done. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and you bring up a point, you know, that I, I've noticed just in my study of the Bible over the years, mm -hmm. you know, we have the word of God, but. You know, of course, we didn't have the word of God until Moses. Right. And you're talking about more than 2,000 years mm -hmm. before Moses was on the earth. Mm -hmm. And so you'll find that God 
his preferred method of teaching is illustration. Mm. It's not mm. so much, you know, a lot of talk. God prefers, his preferred method of teaching is illustration. And of course, we're not going to go deep into the sanctuary service, but of course, the sanctuary service is where they had to slay the lamb. Mm -hmm. It was an illustration of the lamb of God, Christ, who was going to come and die for our sins. Mm -hmm. So for thousands of years, there was these lambs being offered to teach or to illustrate through or to teach through illustration that Christ was going to come and die for our sins. Mm -hmm. So God's preferred method of teaching is always illustration. Yeah, because when he moves, like, you know, like we, you know, the last episode we talked about, you know, how it's, it's, you can view the Bible like a movie, you know, yeah. and the, with movies, you know, good movies, especially like all of the, you know, you know, Marvel movies and stuff. People go to that stuff because of the special effects. That's yeah. what God does. Yeah. And when he does something big, even, even when he does something small. Yeah. You know. And that's just <laughs> it. I don't mean to cut you off, but when God does something big, again, that's normal. He's God. Mm -hmm. When God does something that seems small and draws attention to it, mm -hmm. it's big. Yeah. Because it's out of the norm. Right. You know what I'm saying? It's out of the norm. You got when you look for God, you gotta look for what he does that is out of the ordinary for him. Right. So for us, you know, parting the Red Sea is like, wow. Right. For God is like, that's nothing. You yeah. know what I'm saying? It's like Monday, eight o'clock. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so when he does something that seems insignificant. Yet he draws attention to it, then it's big because it's out of the ordinary. You know, speaking of which, as you know, being in Genesis, like I said, it you know, it took me about a year to get through Genesis, but I realized that, you know, little things matter. And that's oh, yeah. why you have to take your time and read, you know, word if it's a word in there, it's there for a reason. Yeah. You know, I think that's, you know, in order to become a, a good Bible student, you have to first acknowledge that. Because when I was younger, you know, I just read through and skipped over stuff. And that like, doesn't mean nothing. Or, or or it just seemed insignificant to yeah. me. If it's there, it's significant. So when you yes. said whatever God does is small, it's just like even in the small things, you know, in his word, you just have to just like the word plant. You know, we'll get to that. Yeah. You know, I breezed by that. For years, times. right? Yeah. For years. So did I. Yeah. <laughs> so did I. It's just like, okay, the Garden of Eden, I heard of that before. I got to spend too much time there because I know what it is. Yeah. Or you think, are you sure? Yeah. Are you, you, sure? you know what it means. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and so, yeah, that I mean, that's just how it is when you come to God's word. And as we kind of touched upon uh, in the first episode that, you know, from an author's standpoint, everything that you put that, that makes it through the editing process mm -hmm has been well thought out mm -hmm. and you, you leave it in for a, a specific reason. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're talking about, you know, um, 6,000 years of history. Mm -hmm. He couldn't put it all, every detail in here. So the details he decided to put in here, he must have felt were of the utmost importance. Absolutely. Because he's the one that inspired the prophets to write and the writers of the Bible to write and so on and so forth. So they couldn't just choose to put in what they wanted to put in. It would yeah. have to be guided by God what they put in. And as with generally any history, you know, everything is not going to make it. It's not important. No. You know, you know, in American history and, in, you know, there's just certain things that happen. Definitely. You know, all of the wars that were recorded that, you know, obviously the historians felt were significant are there. But. You know, you can't tell me that there weren't other wars going around and affecting other parts yeah. of the And, and you're not going to get every detail. You can't. Yeah. You know, if you think about a history, you don't have the amount of time that the history happened to read the history. You know what right. I'm saying? Right. And then you have to understand, even while history is going on, I hope I'm not getting too deep, yeah. but you got, you know, a thousand different lives going on. So each one of those is a separate story in that mm -hmm. time frame. Mm -hmm. So there's no way you know, in giving a historical record, you can give every detail. Right. So when we're talking about God, the impartial judge of the, of the earth, we're talking about somebody who is giving us the word of God because our life depends on it. Mm -hmm. And so what he decides to put in the Bible has been well thought out from an infinite, intelligent perspective. And that's why we need that infinite perspective of the Holy Spirit to guide us through. And we cannot come into the Bible with our own finite intelligence and decide what's important and what's not. We, we need the Holy Spirit 
to be there to say, stop here, take some yes. time here, wait here. No, yes. this is enough. You know what I'm saying? Yes. This is this is not like a a history book that you or a cyclopedia yes. written by man who has a bias, you know, view on history. This is coming from God, and it's a life or death situation. Case in point, we were studying one of the kings. Um, uh, I don't know if it was. I can't remember who we were studying, but. Literally, it said, you know, we were trying to, you know, we were, you know, looking at the history of of, of, of that king, and literally, it was a verse that said, you know, did you look in king? <laughs> oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, you smart the study that we did, yeah, when we were studying Daniel, Daniel and we were tracing yeah, things, yeah, yeah. It was probably uh, Jehoiakim, yeah, Jehoiakim, or, yeah, or, and it, it referred. To, we went to Kings and then it referred you to Chronicles. Yeah, so yeah, so yeah, 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 yeah. So it's like everything is here. You know, you just have to know where to look and, and be willing to take your time and just say, you know, well, yeah. humble yourself and say, hey, I want to know. and But it's there. It, it, yeah. It's there. And, and now that we have, you know, the complete canon, you know, since uh, John wrote the book of Revelation, that was the last book of the Bible. Mm -hmm. Now we know we have the complete revelation that God desired us to have. Mm -hmm. And so now at this point, you know, as they say, hindsight is twenty twenty. Mm -hmm. Now we can look from beginning to end, and you can make those connections from the beginning to the end. So here's where I'm going to be a little bit of a troublemaker here. And, and everybody that's listening, we definitely want you to drop comments. You know, um, we may or may not be able to answer them directly in this particular video, but we will be sure to address the comments either uh, in the chat when we do it. Uh, all right, hang on one second. Uh, you guys had a quick little technical uh, issue, but I think we should be fine. Uh, we are back up. Are you? Okay, I was making sure you weren't moving, so I was just nah. making sure you were good. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, drop those comments, and we'll be sure to uh, respond. Um, whether we, you know, do a specific uh, podcast just to respond to certain comments, at least for right now, till we back up the library the way we really want to be. Um, or we'll just kind of drop them back in the uh, in the comments, whether it's on YouTube or Facebook. Um, what I did want to say is, in, in, without going too deep, we were talking about what was supposed to be in this Bible is in this Bible. Yeah. You know, there's been conversations. I've had conversations about the Apocrypha. Uh -huh. And I don't want to spend too much time on it, but that's something that we probably will not even address. And here's the question I have. If you were concerned about the Apocrypha, I have to challenge you to ask yourself this. Have you read the books that are already here first? And if you have, that's that's one thing. But if you haven't, um, just just challenge yourself to, to, to think about why you worried about what's in the Apocrypha when you don't know the perfection that's in this book here. And I speak that from experience, um, you know, because I've, you know, pondered and, and traveled. And I think a lot of us have. You know, we wonder that we're missing something, but we have something right in front of us that is so perfect. And sometimes we overlook that thinking that there's something else out there that we need to see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we we've been studying for a while now yeah. together. I mean, and, and you've seen how much that is in here that you can miss. Yes. And it's not just like you said, what's on the surface. And then you also have those other layers beneath that. But then it's also the interconnectedness of the different books and you know how god has a, have a line of truth from beginning to end and you can trace it yes and even talking about like the sabbath like we were saying you see it started here in genesis chapter two mm -hmm. again based on what god did mm -hmm. and then you know um you <clears throat> ask maybe why he did it and so on and so forth excuse me i have something in my throat mm -hmm. but um again it's the creator's memorial to remind man not to forget that God is the creator and provider of all things. Right. And like we said in the Genesis chapter two, we're introduced to things that are issues here in the end. Mm -hmm. And one of the major issues here in the end is where do we come from? Were we created or did we evolve? You know what I'm saying? Now, think about this. You know, if mankind had forever kept that seventh day Sabbath from the beginning, like all mankind. He never could have fell for anything other, you know, like a, a, a lie, like evolution, a deception, like evolution. Mm -hmm. So Satan's first step 
to convince mankind of an alternative, you know, mode of creation would first have to diminish the creator's memorial, that mm -hmm. weekly reminder that God had provided all things. Mm -hmm. Once you can diminish the creator's memorial in people's mind, then you can move them away from even acknowledging God altogether. Mm -hmm. Then they can get settled in and just think, well, maybe God isn't real at all. Then you move into, okay, if God isn't real, how we got here? Right. And then you move into, you know, things like evolution. Right. But um, again, the Sabbath is based on Christ resting on the seventh day in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And I say Christ because we know from the New Testament where we say God created the heavens and the earth. This is a reference to Christ who created all things. Mm -hmm. But then he reconfirms the Sabbath in the Hebrew dispensation. And this is what I mean, tracing something from Genesis and you see it, you know, go all the way through you know, to the end of the Bible. Mm -hmm. So he reconfirms it in the Hebrew dispensation mm -hmm. by coming down from heaven, speaking it with his own voice, mm -hmm. writing it with his own finger mm -hmm. on tables of stone. Mm -hmm. And when he did it, he referenced the creation story. Wow. See what I'm saying? So when he reconfirms it, he doesn't say that this is for you as the Hebrews. He says, this is my Sabbath. He never called it a man's Sabbath. The seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord thy God. It is his Sabbath. It is his memorial. Mm -hmm. And again, his own voice, his own finger, and the reason why he referenced, because the Lord created the earth in six days and rested on the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So again, he's not, you know, referring to that man has anything to do with this. Mm -hmm. This is mine. So when he reconfirms it, he reconfirms it by pointing back to where he first established it. Mm. And then of all the Ten Commandments, you know, it's the only one that starts with the word. Remember. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> the one that we forgot. Yep. Because Satan would have to make you forget the Creator's memorial in order to introduce a new uh, origin for man's creation. And so in the Jewish dispensation, how did it start? In the Jewish dispensation, Satan loaded down the Sabbath with man-made restrictions. I was just about to okay, say, say no, yeah, I was just about to touch on that because uh, Pharisees did the same thing. Yeah, um, you know, and that's what makes it challenging because the Sabbath shouldn't be burdensome. Yeah, and see that which God created to be a blessing. Yes, by getting man to add something. Remember, yes. man had nothing to do with the Sabbath; it was all God. Yes, but when man starts to add to what God has done then it becomes burdensome and then it can be viewed as contemptuous. Yes. Now, from my own experience, um, you know, I, I don't follow any particular doctrine, just, just studying the Bible as, as it is right now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I have come to the truth that the Sabbath is important. And there's something I always was conflicted about because when I was younger, you know, you know, I hear different people, you know, observe different things for different reasons. And I'm just like, you know, Sunday, I'm, I'm, well, I would never think that that was something that would be um, something I'd be doing within my experience. Yeah. Um, and here's the thing, too. I don't necessarily think I get it all right because I'm just kind of learning and coming into it, mm -hmm. you know, but I have made attempts to adjust work schedules and things like that. Yeah. And, you know, there's a certain peace of mind that comes. It's not so much burdensome when you are trying to spend uh, the time with the creator. It, no. It's really not. Um, I find at times at peace, you know, I'm able to study. I study with my family. Um, you know, even just being with nature. I, I mean, it's it's something that if you just take a moment to just read through and acknowledge when you start to do things because it's something that God prepared for us, um, it becomes less burdensome. It was never meant to be. Like I said, it was made burdensome. This was a, a tactic of the devil by taking men who really weren't uh, submitted to God. We know this because these are the same ones who mm -hmm. actually crucified Christ. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we know they weren't submitted to God. Mm -hmm. And so now, because these people are in a position of leadership who actually don't really love God, they're trying to appease him, which is unacceptable to God. God doesn't Asks us to do things to appease him. That's yeah. not how this works. Yeah. And so now they say, well, God wants this day holy. We're going to make sure it's holy. 
And so they're telling the people, you can't do this, you can't do this, you yeah. can't do that. Can't tie your shoes. Whatever, <laughs> whatever. But when you go to the fourth commandment, you don't see any of those things. Right. So there is the Sabbath of the Lord, which is, you know, stated in the fourth commandment. Mm-hmm. And then there is the Sabbath with the uh, restrictions that we see in the New Testament that God never um, required. And I know we're going to get to this because I know Paul addresses that and people get his words confused around how and why he's addressing that. Um, you know, because there's always the I, I got you moments, you know, they, they yeah. met at the temple before they travel. Um, you know, yeah, yeah, why did yeah, Jesus yeah. heal this person on, you know, it's kind of like. And I, I mean, that's actually a good question. Why did Christ <laughs> heal somebody on the Sabbath? Because he actually restored them on the Sabbath. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Sabbath again means rest. Right. The root word to restored is rest. Right. So it's easier for people to rest when they're in good health and good mental um, state peace and so on and so forth so the sabbath has always been about restoration yes. you know what i'm saying and common sense too yeah you know because i think the bible uh, references if, if your oxen falls into a ditch you're going to leave it in a ditch of course kind of like the sabbath <laughs> commandment it doesn't say don't <laughs> don't help anybody you know on the sabbath right and you know like i said sabbath means rest and restoration mm-hmm. and so again when we start to trace this from genesis to the new testament and we know that um, Christ in the beginning made man on the sixth day, right? Mm-hmm. And then it says, after the sixth day, he had finished his work. Mm-hmm. And then he blessed the seventh day that he rested. Mm-hmm. Now, in the New Testament, again, I said that God likes to teach through illustration, right? In the sixth day, excuse me, in the New Testament, Christ died on the sixth day mm-hmm. to save man. Mm-hmm. On the cross, he then says, it is finished. Mm-hmm. Then he goes to the grave and he rests the same 24 hours in redemption as he did creation. And that's what makes it perfection. It's like he could have rose whenever he wanted to. Whenever he wanted to. But the same six day he created man is the same six day he died for man. After that, in the beginning, he said it's finished. On the cross, he said it's finished. Then after he says it's finished, in the Old Testament in Genesis when he created man, in the New Testament in the, um, when he's redeeming man, he rests the same seven day for 24 hours. Mm-hmm. Now, again, we just noted from your question that, um, you know, God doesn't get tired. Mm-hmm. Why did he rest? And now we see that that's out of the ordinary. And now we go to the New Testament mm-hmm. and Christ says, I'm the way and the truth and the life. Right. I am the very source of life. Now, God being alive is not out of the ordinary. But now this God who is life itself is in the grave dead for the same 24 hours that he rested in the beginning. See what I'm saying? This is unusual for he who is life to be dead, which makes the seventh day the most unique day in all of eternity. Never in eternity past, never in eternity future. Will God be dead? That is the one day in all of eternity that he who is the source of life was sleep, resting, dead in the grave. And it just happens to be the same day he decided to rest in the beginning. See what I'm saying? The creator's memorial. Now it's the redeemer's memorial. God was resting sleep dead in the grave for the same seventh day that he did in creation that is not ordinary that is the most unique day in all of eternity not to mention it's going to tie into uh you know i don't want to call it the final sabbath yeah that that millennial yeah that millennial sabbath yeah 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 so you know you know, there's so much that we can get into about rest, too. And I want to. But you, know, you, you said something earlier about, you know, um, the Sabbath and it being about our relationship with God. And, you know, you know, you've heard of the two great commandments. I know. Right. Um, yeah. Let's go to Mark. Let's go to the book of Mark, chapter 12, because Christ was asked the question, you know, um, what is the greatest commandment? And, you know, when you were talking about the Sabbath, like I said, you said that this has to deal with our relationship with him 
And when we talk about relationship with God, we're talking about love. You right. know what I'm saying? Right. And this is something I found unique about Genesis chapter two and the two great commandments. You know what I'm saying? And um, Mark chapter 12, we're going to look at verse 29. Mark 12, 29. Let me get this. Mark 12, 29. I just thought this was an interesting, you know, kind of uh, point. So after he was asked, which is the first commandment of all, in 29 it says, And Jesus answered him, The first of all commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love thy the Lord, excuse me, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. And with all thy strength, this is the first commandment. But he goes on and says, and the second is like, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none of the commandment greater than these. Now, as you said, the Sabbath is kind of dealing with directly, you know, our relationship with God. God is asking us to do something for him. Right. You know what I'm saying? This is my Sabbath. I want you to honor my Sabbath. By honoring my Sabbath, you honor me as the creator. And as we see now in the New Testament, you also honor me as redeemed. So that kind of encompasses the first great commandment. Thou shalt love God with all thy heart, all thy mind, all thy soul. But he says the second is like unto it. You love your neighbor as yourself. Now, at the end of the chapter, Adam is introduced to his first neighbor. Do you see how the Alpha and the Omega of this chapter, the beginning and the end of this chapter is the two great commandments? Adam didn't have a neighbor. He said, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, let's go to Genesis chapter 2 and see what Adam said about Eve when she was introduced. And see if he doesn't use the same wording as the second commandment. Same wording. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. All right. Starting at verse 22. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man and adam said this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh so when adam saw eve the very words he was inspired to say is i have to love her like myself see that so in the beginning of the chapter, you have something that God introduces that takes into a, um, perspective the first great commandment. Then at the very end of the chapter, you have Adam being introduced to his first neighbor, his wife, and you have almost the same wording as the second great commandment, showing that, you know, God is really doing something. Like I said, we, we talked one time about, um, you know, film and that you're not supposed to see the writer's hand. Right. And but with God, he tells a story and you can't see his hand. But once you start saying over and over again, it is so exciting to see the author's hand. Right. And all these things that you miss. Right. Because I you know how many years I studied Genesis chapter two and had never put that the be it starts with kind of the first great commandment and then it ends with this marriage relationship, which is pointing to the second great commandment, showing that God has he works through patterns. And this is something that I've learned over the years mm -hmm. in studying the Bible. It's God works through patterns. Yes. And then once you understand what the patterns are, then it's easy to follow true from Genesis to Revelation. You can see it clearly all the way throughout. It's like he's signing his name right. all throughout the scriptures. Right. And you start to see that there are no new concepts introduced in the New Testament at all. None. None. And, and, and literally, some of the stories follow the same pattern. He it, yeah, the same, we'll get yeah. through it. Some of the stories is kind of identical. And, you know, dare I say, um, <laughs> all of the patterns typically usually point to Christ. You know? Exactly. You know, Abraham and Isaac, Joseph, like all of those patterns typically, yeah. Yeah. you know, yeah. <laughs> now, like Christ said in John 5, 39, search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life, but they are they that testify of me. Mm. Now, when he said that, the New Testament was not written. You know what I'm saying? He was still walking with his disciples. So they had not written the New Testament yet. So when he says search the scriptures 
For in them ye think ye have eternal life, but they are they that testify of me. He's pointing back to the Old Testament. Wow. So whereas many people think Christ is in the New Testament, I see Christ from Genesis all the way to Malachi. And, you know, we, we've gone through it and, and mm. see how the stories are just, you know, pregnant with Christ before Mary ever comes on the scene. You know yeah. what I'm saying? And, and, and I know we're going to get to this in uh, probably episode four. But just like we see it, so did Satan. Yeah. Yeah. We'll say that. We'll say <laughs> I, I know where you got to go. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and it just it's just a nod to the fact that we we underestimate our adversary. The adversary that's going to be on the scene in, in, in the next episode, probably. Well, we actually touch upon him now. Okay. So, like we said, we left with that cliffhanger of Eden. And, you know, we just talked about how um, God brought Adam, Eve to Adam, and then Eden became their first home. Right. So we can kind of now focus in on Eden, which by default causes us to focus in on Lucifer. You, you can't study Eden without running into Lucifer. And Absolutely. I'm not, and I'm, we're not even talking about the two trees and the serpent. And <sighs> we're talking yeah, about, yeah. you know, again, answering that cliffhanger question. Where did Eden come from if it was planted? Because, you know, when I plant a plant, if, if I plant a seed, whatever I plant, it's already in existence. And then I take it from one place and I put it in another. And so, you know, to unravel the mystery of Eden, we got to go to the book of Ezekiel. But I think before we do that, let's, let's, let's just revisit how God created the other foliage. What do you mean? Oh, in chapter one? Yeah. Surround verse. 11. Yeah. God said, Let the earth. Yeah, that's right. And God said, Let the earth. Okay, I was muted. <laughs> and God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after its kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. So basically, he spoke all this into an existence, right? Yeah. And now, you know, based upon what I'm reading, you know, he spoke it. And now the seed is in the earth. That particular seed is in the earth now. Something yeah. that he spoke. All right. Now, I think that sets the stage for people to start the comparison. Because if you just get past that, it's yeah. going to be hard to really focus in on that comparison. That, okay. That I know you're about to, to drop once. Yeah. So... <laughs> Since you read that, go ahead and read Genesis 2 and verse 8, which, you know, to, to contrast Eden. Okay. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. All right. So it, clearly it says that he planted the garden of Eden. And so, again, Eden is here in Genesis, but it's all, all of a sudden it's mentioned in Ezekiel. You know, it's not mentioned pretty much anywhere else. You know, it's mentioned a few places where it just comes up in conversation. Mm -hmm. But it's mentioned in Ezekiel is very, very mysterious. Mm -hmm. So let, let's go Do to tell. Ezekiel. Do tell. The book of Ezekiel. Chapter 28. Ezekiel 28. Uh, we're going to start at verse 12. And it says, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. So let me stop there. Because, you know, if people aren't uh, familiar with these texts, they just heard, you know, Ezekiel is supposed to talk to this king of Tyrus. And they may think that, you know, this is a ordinary man mm -hmm. but ezekiel is not addressing an ordinary man so real quick let's just turn to isaiah 14 because in isaiah 14 you can see it clear sometimes prophets are told to address their ruling power but they're not actually talking about the physical ruling power mm -hmm. they're talking about the spiritual ruling power 
-hmm. And it just so happens in Isaiah 14, when Isaiah is told to um, address a physical uh, ruling power, that as he goes on, he actually names who he's actually talking to. All right. And so starting at Isaiah 14 and verse four, it says that thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, how hath the oppressor ceased, the golden city ceased. And I don't want to read all of the verses in between. They can, you guys can do that in your own time. But just to get to the point, drop down to verse 12. And it says, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down, which did weaken the nations? And so though Isaiah was told to address the king of Babylon, when the veil is pulled back, he's not actually talking to a man. He's talking to Lucifer, the ruling power behind the king. And it's the same thing in Ezekiel 28. And we'll see why this is not talking about a man. It's talking about Lucifer. All right. Going back to Ezekiel 28. In verse 12, it says, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Verse 13, Thou hast been in Eden, the guard of God, garden of God, and every precious stone with thy covering, the sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle and gold. The workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was not born, but created. So whoever this king of Tyrus is, he wasn't born, he was created. Whoever this king of Tyrus is, he was in Eden, the garden of God. Now, Ezekiel lived, I don't know how many centuries after the flood, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. And the Garden of Eden was not there anymore after the flood. So whoever this king of Tyrus is, he's old enough to have been in Eden. And he was also created. But verse 14 gives it away. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou was upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. So this is actually talking about Lucifer. Before his fall. Look at verse 15. Thou was perfect in all thy ways from the day that thou was again created till iniquity was found in thee. And so what we're seeing is Lucifer one was anointed the anointed cherub that covereth. Cherub is another word for what we might call um the heavenly angels. You know what right. I'm saying? We first see them actually in Genesis chapter three. Um, by they put at the eight the tree, yeah, right. to keep the tree of life. Right. So this is not talking about a man. This is talking about a, an angel, specifically the anointed cherub that covered. Now, if you go to Exodus twenty-five, when Moses was making um, the sanctuary and he was making the mercy seat, which is an illustration of the throne of God, he was told to put two cherubs, two, gold, ch two cherubs. yeah, cherubim, cherub, plural. Yeah. And that their wings were to cover the mercy seat. Mm -hmm. So the presence for God was to be on the mercy seat. And the wing of the angel was to cover mm -hmm. the presence of God. Mm -hmm. So when it says that he was the anointed cherub that covereth, it's saying that he had a position right there, the throne of God. And it was his station to stretch forth his wing and cover the presence of God. So, you know, if his wing is covering the presence of God, his face is looking right at him. Right. He had the closest position to God that there was. Now, going back to verse 13, because everything you get to verse 15 is before his fall. Reading again, verse 15, it says, For thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. Mm -hmm. And then from verse 16, it starts talking about his fall. After iniquity was found in him. But everything prior to 15 is talking about him in his state of perfection. Mm -hmm. So let's go back to verse 13 and look at it again. In Ezekiel? Yeah. Okay. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of Adam and Eve. Is that what it says? Yep. No, it doesn't. The garden of God. Ah. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of 
God. And this is before Eden was on earth. Right? Exactly. Yeah. This is before his fall. Right. So he was in Eden, the garden of God. Remember, we said, or we didn't say, but Genesis chapter <laughs> 2 said that uh, God planted, planted the garden of Eden. So he took Eden from heaven. From heaven, because it was the garden of God where Lucifer used to be. And he put it on earth. Mm. Mm. And then it says that he took the man that he had formed and put him in Eden. Now, let's dissect that for a second, because I'm assuming that just pissed Lucifer off. <laughs> say it bluntly, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Again, like we, I said earlier, God likes to teach through illustration. Mm -hmm. So what is being illustrated, if he brings Eden down from heaven and puts it on earth, and Satan sees the garden that he used to be in, and now he sees this new order of being being placed where he used to be. What's the message? Yeah. What is the message that's being conveyed or being illustrated? Yeah, that's the uh, that's the old, you know, they don't know, they'll let you clear out your office before they bring a new guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So again, by teaching by illustration, God is saying that these new order of beings that have been created are meant to take the place of those who fall. Which is... You know, I know we're going to get into this, but this speaks uh, specifically to the beef that he kind of has with us. He's like, wait, you're no better than me. And that's kind of where we start to uh, maybe that animosity. We start to see that animosity there because, like, you, you think you can replace me? Well, yeah, I mean, it, it's not even so much towards us. It's still trying to, you know, overthrow the authority and the plan of God. Yeah, yeah. Because ultimately, let's, let's we say... We caught in the middle. Yeah, just like, you know, I, I said, I was jokingly saying, uh, just like they bring a new guy in, but ultimately, you'll be mad at the bosses or whatever. Yeah. But you go and try to throw a monkey wrench in the new guy's plan. Because... Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You know. So, you know, we kind of get a intimation of this also from Christ in Matthew 22, when he talks about um, the children of the resurrection are like the angels in heaven. Mm -hmm. They don't marry and give in marriage and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So he was addressing something, but he basically said that, you know, mankind, once this is all over, they're not going to marry and give in marriage anymore. They will be like the angels in heaven. Mm -hmm. Kind of bookending what he um, illustrated when he put man in Eden, mm -hmm. that they would take the angels' places. Mm -hmm. And so, again, yeah, this is um, what, what was being illustrated. And also, if you go to the book of Revelation, here, here's something, too, because um, in Ezekiel 28, 14, it said that Satan walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. And it just so happens in Revelation where we get an unveiled view of the throne of God, you kind of see what is being referred to. Mm -hmm. So go to Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. They say that Satan walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. But in Revelation chapter 4, when we get a picture of God's throne, because remember, his position was at God's throne. And we're going to look at verse 6. And it says, And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto what? Crystal. Crystal. What is crystal? Like glass, right? It's like a glass, but it's really stone. Mm. See what I'm saying? So we be thinking stone and we thinking ugly stones. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm. But you know, sapphires are stones and, and emeralds are stones. So again, verse 6. And before the throne was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around about the throne, four beasts and so on and so forth. Now let's compare that to Revelation 15 and verse 2. Revelation 15 and verse 2. Mm. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with what? Fire. Thank you. So before the throne of God, there's a sea of glass like unto crystal, but it's actually mingled with fire. Mm. So it's in order to walk to God's throne, you got to walk in the midst of that crystal mingled with fire. So when it says that he walked up and down this, um, the stones of fire, it's talking about him coming from and going to 
God's throne. And, you know, that puts it in a really interesting perspective on, you know, on us, the way we view Satan today or Lucifer today. Yeah. You know, we really underestimate him. He was second in command almost. Pretty much after Christ. You know, the only one that could come in, 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 in that proximity. He was given, yeah, because it says the anointed cherub that yeah. covered. That's like a definite article, like he was one of a kind. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, and, yeah. <laughs> uh, <I won't. laughs> so we, we underestimate, you know, we, we, we always have God here, but all of a sudden, um, you know, we have this... <laughs> This 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 mentality that Satan is just in my arm, oh, I'm, I'm you know stomp on him, and and that's good, but we, we can't underestimate the power that yeah. he wields. If, if you're living in obedience to God and you're not yielding to the <laughs> sin and so on and so forth, but you ain't gonna stop no stomp Satan if you're yielding to sin. That's, yeah, that's, that's just the deception. Yeah, you know, but but it, yeah, so that that basically is you know the backdrop of Eden. You know what I'm saying? There's a lot more going on with Eden than we might think. So I've got two questions. Yeah. So when he was when when God planted Eden on Earth, I guess there was no restriction. He just had access to Lucifer. Well, not necessarily. He only had access at that tree. You'll never hear him pass that tree. It's a good question though. Oh. Huh. It's a very good question. But no, he only had access at that tree. Huh. Yeah, yeah, we're actually going to get into that a little bit more, I think. Uh, I think in the next one, okay. I think, because yeah, um, the next See, one. I, I think I know Genesis in and, in and out, and every now and then there's, there's something that pops up, and you know, yeah, 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 yeah. you know, the fact that you know, we had to take the form of the serpent, and you know, did that play part on you know, have any bearing? You know, another another important point, and I know we'll be wrapping up uh, this episode soon, uh, is there's not much, you know, for him to be a major antagonist. There's not much or, or not in so many places that we actually get descriptives or, or much talk about Satan, about Lucifer. I mean, we, 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 we get it in Ezekiel, but other than that, yeah, there, there's a few places here and here there, and there. <laughs> because it's more important to understand his character than his person, like his, right. his, his physical being. I say physical being, even though he's a spirit, but you right. know, his, his person than his, his character than his person. Because what you see, and we said this before, that, you know, in Genesis chapter one, when the spotlight comes on, mm -hmm. God is the only one there and he's the main star of the Bible. Mm -hmm. And so, Lucifer is the main antagonist of the Bible. But after, you know, these opening chapters in Genesis, both of them seem seem to fade to the background. And what we start to see is the two characters playing out of the individuals that we're reading about. Right. And so though we don't get a lot of Satan as far as, you know, directly about Satan, when you see sin carried out mm -hmm. and you see how people act when they're not yielded to the will of God, what is being um, demonstrated is the character of Satan. Right. So now we're getting it through the individuals that we're reading about. We get people like Joseph, you know what I'm saying, and Daniel, by which we see the character of God. Right. And then we get, you know, other people like Cain and so on and so forth, by which we see the character of Satan. Right. But, you know, the descriptions that we have of Satan, you know, I guess to many people are shocking. He's full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. Yeah. Covered with jewels. Uh, opposed to what, you know, mainstream world, Hollywood, whatever wants to, you know, devil's horns and all of this stuff. And you know, it's just a great deception. You know, yeah. you know, somebody that really wants to trick you is not going to give you like some poison, like with bubbling cauldron and yeah. say, here, drink this. They're going to make it, you know, with nice apple pie or something. Yeah, or whipped cream on whipped top. Whipped cream on top. Yeah. The cherries is going to smell yeah. good. But the thing is, he was created by God for a highly exalted station. Yes. And so he, he bears the appearance of that. He's beautiful. He's intelligent. Um, as if we read it, we didn't really zoom in on it, but thy tablets and thy pipes were prepared in thee from the day that thou was created. Mm -hmm. You know, tablets are percussion instruments mm -hmm. and pipes are you know, basically melody instruments. So he had music, you know, designed into his very being. 
which is something we'll probably touch later. Why yeah, of musical course. Musical influence is dangerous course, and deadly, if not. Yeah, so it's like this story is more dramatic and, and more interesting to me than anything of fiction because it, it's absolutely real and we're absolutely in it. And most people don't know the objectives of the warfare. And the, if you don't know the objective of the enemy, you know, it's it, almost definite that he's going to get you because you don't know how <laughs> to defend right, yourself right. and you don't know what the objective is. Right. So, but yeah, so as we do bring this to a close, you know, there may be some who think it's far-fetched that God took a garden from <laughs> from Eden and brought it down to earth. But, you know, there's another lens in which to look at this because Eden is foreshadowing something that we see in Revelation. Mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. and we're talking about the holy city mm -hmm. so if you think it's far-fetched for god to bring a garden down then how what do you say about revelation that says he's going to bring an entire capital city down when this is all said and done and of course you can find that in revelation 21 verses 1 through 3 and revelation 22 1 through 3 where john says he saw the holy city new jerusalem come down from god out of heaven so whereas in the beginning, God brought this little piece of heaven in the garden and brought it here, it was actually foreshadowing that God would one day bring down the entire capital city of New Jerusalem, right? And Earth itself would become the capital of the universe. Right. So here's a, here's a question, a, a good one to end. What happened to Eden? <laughs> Well, well, we, well, we know what happens. Uh, well, we, we didn't get to that point. What what happens uh, as far as um, us, us discussing in, in the discussion? Um, I mean, we know what happens when Adam, you know, and, and Eve get the boot. Um, <laughs> you know, yeah, you know that's that's actually another <laughs> um, good point because we didn't touch on that point. But there's some very telling wording when he did, you know, when they did get the boot. So if you look at <laughs> Genesis chapter 3, Genesis chapter 3, no, no, chapter 2, what am I saying? Genesis chapter 2, no, I'm right, Genesis chapter 3, Genesis chapter 3, and verse... Twenty-three, Genesis three twenty-three. Mm -hmm. It says, "Therefore the Lord God sent him Adam forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken." You, did you see, catch that? Yeah. So man wasn't taken from the ground the that ground was in from Eden. Eden. It was other ground. So remember, he made man of the dust of the ground. He breathed into him the breath of life. And he became a living soul. Mm -hmm. And then it says he took the man and he placed him in the garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. Or he planted the garden eastward in Eden. And there he put the man that he had formed. Right. So again, Adam was created of the dust of the earth. Mm -hmm. Eden was planted from someplace else. Right. So he sent him forth from Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. Yep. Because he was not taken from the ground of Eden itself. And he was no longer eligible to, to be in the holy presence of God. Amen. Amen. So, you know, there's another interesting point as well. Um, in that we didn't read this in Ezekiel. I think we need to read this. Go back to Ezekiel 21. Okay. Because, you know, where in one place we see that Adam, representing mankind, was placed in the Garden of Eden, signifying that he was going to take the place of the angels. Or mankind, because that's what Adam's name actually means, mankind. Okay. So that mankind was going to take the place of the angels. Okay. Now, now, now look at Ezekiel 28. I, this is just incredible. Ezekiel 28. Let me get there. Ezekiel 28 and verse, you're going to look at verses 16 and 18. Again, still talking about um, Lucifer, the anointed cherub. It says, by the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled thee, the midst of thee with violence and thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will do what? Destroy thee. Destroy thee, O covering cherub. Here's another, you know, controversial topic. Satan, it says, gets destroyed. I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Verse 18. 
Thou hast filled, thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thy iniquities, by the iniquity of thy tra traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee. I will bring thee to what? Ashes. ashes upon where? The earth. I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth. Now, think about this. God brings Eden down to earth. Mm -hmm. There he puts the man that he has formed, mm -hmm. illustrating that mankind is to take the place of the angel that fell. Mm -hmm. Then in Ezekiel, we're told that Lucifer, this covering cherub, will be brought to ashes upon the earth. Mm. The same earth where he took man from the dust of the ground. Mm. So not only is mankind going to trade places with them, those angels are going to trade places with man. Mm. And they're going to take the place of that dust where mm. man was taken from. They can truly die. Yes. <laughs> he will be brought to ashes upon the earth. So God is going to take the dust of the earth and mankind and exalt it up to heaven. Mm. And take those angels who, angels who rebelled and reduce them to dust upon the earth. So I'm going to uh, introduce a troublemaking question. Uh, and it's something that we probably won't address as of yet, maybe not even the next episode. Uh, just think about this, everybody who, who who's listening and, and with this, I just challenge you to think about this. Um, if if Lucifer Satan's gonna be turned to ash, right? <laughs> how how are it. how is he gonna be tormenting you know souls forever and ever in in, in hell? I'm just putting the question out there. So just think about that one. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. It's a good question. <laughs> if we know he's going to be destroyed, um, you know, because that, you know, since I was growing up in church, that was the whole consensus. You know, you go to hell forever and ever and you're tormented by his his demons and Satan and, you know, he's on the grill flipping you over and all <laughs> kinds of stuff. Yeah, I remember that book. Yeah, 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 yeah. How is that going to happen when, you know, Satan himself is not even going to be in, 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 in... He's supposed to be destroyed. Yeah, yeah. he's supposed to be and, destroyed, so... You know, and what Christ said in the New Testament, you know, even though he's saying this to those who are lost amongst humanity, but he says, you know, depart ye to everlasting fire. But then he says, that was prepared for the devil and his angels. Yep. You know what I'm saying? So it wasn't prepared, it was prepared for, for, for mankind. It was actually prepared for the devil and his angels. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, very good question. Very good question. But I think we might touch upon that a little bit in the next episode. Maybe okay, not deep okay, okay. because, you know, we, we got a, a bunch of stuff. But, um, yeah, the next episode is the triumph of the adversary. You know, Ooh. so we, we've been talking about how the stage is being set. He gets, he know, gets, a, he gets a hash mark. You know, oh, he gets, he he gets a big one, <laughs> you, get you know, as far as mankind goes, you know, but, um, yeah, the stage is set. Eden is brought down. Adam is placed in Eden. The message is sent to Lucifer. Mm -hmm. This is your replacement. And so the stage is set. And now Lucifer makes his move. You yeah. know what I'm saying? This is a drama. This is, this is playing out. This is actually happened. And we're at, you know, the last scenes of this drama in our life today. And so we're, we're talking about all this. But really, is is leading to the point that we're on a stage of action and we have a part to play. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, but it's going back to Genesis to see how things started, so that we can know how to conduct ourselves, you know, right. in the final uh, climax of this controversy, this conflict that's going on between uh, Christ and Satan. Right. And so, you know, just just to touch upon like the three layers. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Because we've been talking about Eden. Mm -hmm. So on the surface, we're told that God, God planted the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. That's on the surface. Now we see in the spiritual warfare, man being placed there was a, a move to show Lucifer that he was going to be replaced. Right. But then we also see a prophetic point of view in that it foreshadowed that God would bring the capital city down to earth. So those three layers seem to always be present when God is doing something. So we may not always bring out all those points, but, you know, I want to show people how, you know, in studying the scriptures, God has all these things into war. Yeah. Yeah. And in terms of the spiritual warfare with Eden, you know, the whole thing is like, you know, a, a big chess match in a sense. And, and right now, when, when, when we're looking at Genesis 1 and 2, 
you know, God's moving his pawn here and there. And then when he plants the seed, it's kind of like, all right, check. Yeah. See, he's like, wait a minute, I got to get out of check. <laughs> yeah, he made the first move. I got to. <laughs> so that that's his strategy. You yeah. know, I'll make this my king, yeah. basically. So yeah. like I said, the stage is being set. Now we turn our attention to the two trees and the confrontation in the midst of the garden. This is where it gets really interesting. This is where a lot is uncovered. Um, when we get into Genesis 3, like I said, uh, Genesis 3, 3.15 held me up for for weeks um, yeah. because I couldn't really understand. But there's so much there's so much in there um, and so much to unpack. You just have to just really pay attention. Um, yeah. You know, I, yeah, you just got to really pay yeah, attention. Yeah, I think Genesis 3.15, that'll have its own episode. I don't think we're going to even touch that that you know in the next episode we're just going to kind of deal okay with satan's temptation and probably, that's it yeah i mean mind. genesis 3 kind of is like almost two or three episodes yeah it could be, be it could nice. be it could be more than that to be honest yeah because you know? <laughs> we're really you know jumping around and i yeah. shouldn't say jumping around which what we're trying to do is show the connection from the beginning to the end right so though we're in genesis we're just in genesis to show the beginning and then tracing it from Genesis to show you how the Bible is telling one continuous story. It's not yes. two stories, Old Testament and New Testament. It is one continuous story from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And so, yeah, um, Genesis 3.15 will get its its own uh, its own episode. Right. And next episode, we'll talk about the temptation. And like I said, if we talk about that temptation, a major part of that temptation is that lie. We shall not surely die. Yes. And so though death was introduced as a concept, you know, in Genesis chapter two, that if you eat of this tree, then you eat of this tree, you shall surely die. You know, we didn't actually dive in this one. Right. Because it really becomes an issue in the next one, because that's where Satan, you know, that was his point. I got to convince them that what God says, he don't mean. Right. And then I can get them to disobey. Right. So we'll dive more into the subject of death. You know, the next episode, because okay. that's where Satan, you know, told his lie. That's where he focused in on. He okay. knew he had to take away that accountability in order to convince man of sin. And guess what? Well, I'm sure he died. <laughs> yeah. So <That> we know. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you for joining in, everyone. Um, you know, it's, it's been a pleasure. We're having an absolute ball, yeah. um, you know, discussing the Bible and hopefully inspiring some of your minds to dig a little deeper and never just take our words for anything. We're just studying. Uh, we're students of the Bible, just like you. Um, Elder Sykes has had a, a, a longer walk <laughs> than, 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 than some of us. Um, and hopefully my experience is, is, is coming into to the following of, of his word and understanding will also be an inspiration. And, you know, as I go through, uh, you know, my process, I hope that you can look at my process and say, hey, you know, I'm I'm right there with you. So, you know, you, you don't have to feel alone. Um, you know, there's people out there um, that we're trying to connect with that, you know, that's been where I was, you know, that's, that's looking for something and we want to connect with you and, and help you find the understanding that you're looking for. So, you know, any questions, comments, uh, uh, what, what we talked about, you know, like I said, let's keep it, um, uh, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? Keep it, uh, what? Not, not necessarily cordial, but... Uh, Respectful. Respectful. Yeah. Keep it in the spirit of Christ. Keep it in the spirit of Christ. And also keep them it keep it in the framework of what we're discussing. We're not trying to debate who's right or wrong. We here already believe that the Bible is true. Um we're not looking to to, to really go outside of that and, and and sway conversations otherwise. So please stay tuned for the next episode next Sunday. Um we're going to be diving in to talk about uh, the, triumph, you know, of the, the triumph of the adversary. You know, he got one off, and that's cool. That's cool. But but he just, yeah, it's coming. So we're looking forward to diving that, diving in with you guys. And um, be sure to share, and we'll be getting all of the information up so you can share links and all of that stuff with your friends and family. Um, you know, we want to boost our following up. Be sure to subscribe on YouTube and on the channel and be sure to follow us on Facebook and uh, get the word out. Um, God's moving and, you know, it's glad, glad to be a part of that movement. So we love you guys. Thank you. And we'll see you next week. Amen.
The Sabbath is on Sunday, right? I've been going to church on Sunday forever. Jesus came to fulfill the law, so we don't have to keep the Ten Commandments, right? God's laws were not meant for us today. We are under His grace, right? Those are old Mosaic laws, and we are under the New Covenant, right? Why does God let bad things happen? Why doesn't He just destroy Satan, right? The Ten Commandments were stolen from ancient Egypt, right? The Bible says that our loved ones go right to heaven when they die, right? If the Bible was written by men, how can it be God's word, right? Will God send me to burn in hell, forever? Are you sure? If not, be sure to tune into the podcast that inspires Bible believers to become Bible students. Grab your Bibles and let's find out. Are you sure? Be sure to tune in. Sundays at 6 p.m.